I mean, I think in this case, I mean, look at the intermediaries that are being eliminated. So we're taking an industry that has fees up to 40, 45%, eliminating that, chopping it down to four to 6%. So immediately there's value created for uh, influencers, for, for brands even, uh, for everybody. So it's a win-win and I think that's, uh, you know, very specific use case, but blockchain applies to every industry and kind of creates that value proposition. Me, so, you know, I'm a little bit unusual. I'm, I'm British. And uh, the thing I hate most in the world is the British flag. Uh, and, and I hate it because it, it represented colonialism and conquering other nations. And I, when I grew up, it was the Vietnam War. Uh, I really supported the Vietnamese. And uh, when the English sent troops into Ireland, I supported the Irish. When Margaret Thatcher went to war with Argentina, I supported Argentina. Uh, not at soccer, only at war. <laughs> Soccer, I was supporting England. So, you know, so I hate, I really hate nationalism. Now, the thing about the, the period we live in, it's globalizing. It's the opposite of what Donald Trump says. Globalizing is good. The first globalizing was the internet itself. Um, actually, if you go further back, it was airplanes and boats. But in our, in our technology era, the internet created a single network, which is everywhere in the world. The second thing was smartphones. Suddenly you had a common platform, uh, billions of people everywhere in the world on the same platform, able to use the same software and speak to each other and talk to each other. Uh, I remember in, uh, in 1997, I wrote a chapter for a book and I said in this chapter, my children will not be able to be racist because they will know people from every country because of the network. They, they will not be this you know, unknown people. They will be known, so it will be very hard to demonize a foreigner, because you will know a foreigner. Um, blockchain is the next wave of globalization. Now it's globalizing transactions. So first you had the network, then you had devices, now you have transactions. And it means that the biggest thing that we are removing is nation states. Nation states are kind of 19th century, 18th century things. Most human beings today have the ability to be global, to move around, to work anywhere in the world, to learn languages, to study in universities outside of their own country, to be a, 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 a part-time worker on behalf of a company that isn't in your own country. We're globalizing and blockchain is the globalization of money and the end of national money. Uh, it's global money and that's a huge thing for the human race. When you look backwards a hundred years from now, when there are no nations, like on Star Trek, and everyone's from the same place, it's called the world, uh, we'll look back to this time as the beginning of that globalization. And globalization will be good. Donald Trump will look like a clown at that time. So everybody talks about decentralization, but I bet most people don't know what it means, but don't really know what we're talking about. So it's really enabling, blockchain enables the sharing economy. So everybody has something to produce or to consume. And so if you think about, I, I spent a lot of time in my career working on decentralizing the energy system, and it's a work in progress, but it's moving in the right direction. So we think about whether or not it's something where you want to borrow money from somebody, you want to lend money to somebody, you want to sell power from your solar panel to somebody else, you want to share their car. The sharing economy is enabled by blockchain. What's interesting is if you look at a lot of models where you have something like, say, an Uber. Uber is a great service. I use it all the time. But what blockchain would enable is actually anybody who has a ride to give somebody else, because of the trust mechanism built into the blockchain where there only can be one one real record of what's happening and occurring you can validate somebody's identity and the, the identity piece is sort of the foundation of everything so if you don't know who someone is you really can't trust them so it brings in it brings in that missing link of just trust to now allow you to share anything you want if you're an artist if you're a musician it, it doesn't really matter what it is and so there's really an infinite number of things like on the the, the book the long tail where they talk about there's an infinite number of, of people that could be rock stars for maybe 30 seconds or a minute or an hour. So everybody has something to share. I think that's the beauty of it. Plus, I, I, I really, I got into this whole thing from the energy perspective, but the idea that 
it levels the playing field and it allows everybody to participate and it takes whatever whatever resource you may have and it spreads it across to more people is really I think the empowering part of it and patron is a good example of one of those services and, and who knows where the platform will go after that um, but I think that's really kind of an exciting place to be it's cool in England you can now choose your, your power provider now, when I was growing up, there was British Gas and British Electric. Of course. And now you can actually switch to a bunch of providers because they were able to decentralize the, the grid. I want to be able to borrow money from you, and you can borrow money from me, and then we'll just agree we'll agree on blockchain how much we're going to pay each other when when it's time to pay it back. Because I don't, um, I I have a credit card that has like a thirty thousand dollar credit limit on it, and I went to I called them up and I asked them if I could use it, and they said the, the, the system's locked, and I said it's been paid off for four years. So I don't understand those kind of centralized control systems on things. Yeah. Whereas if, if you're a trusted party, someone knows that they can trust you, you should be able to just go directly to them, not have somebody else decide your fate. Yeah. So. Well, the control over money is a big deal. I just had this a shock this morning. I've, in England, there's a company called Revolut. Revolut's a new bank. It's called a challenger bank. And I sold some crypto and put the money into my <laughs> Revolut card. And it put it blocked me and gave a message that you're only allowed to put twenty five thousand dollars a year a year onto this card. And you just went over the limit, therefore we've frozen your money. And uh, I needed to pay my sister in law for a vacation. I can't even send her money. So so you know, this centralized point of control pisses me off. I mean, that's my money. I, can, I should be able to do what I want with it. So the idea with the, the uh, control in the hands of the individual over the resources that they, they have, that to me is the ultimate decentralization, where nobody can stop you doing something that's right that you choose to do. We are three of the advisors on the Patron uh, token sale. And we've teamed up with the company. It comes as a Japanese company. What it is about Patron that made us want to uh, support it. So who wants to kick off? Yeah. Sure. I'll, um, I'm David Cohen. I'm one of the advisors to Patron and Patron. And uh, I've been working in blockchain and decentralized software systems for uh, decentralized software for 25 years and blockchain for the past couple of years. And I'm very intrigued by the nature of using a de decentralized media platform to engage customers and bring on influencers into kind of an Uber-like model. And I think that the idea that a centralized notion of having something like LinkedIn or Facebook is the wrong approach to try to get uh, to attract talent. If you're looking for an influencer, if you are an influencer, you want to actually try to become more of an influencer in the market. It's really interesting, I think, to be part of something where it's decentralized and allows you to build your own brand. It, of course, it does, uh, doesn't does excuse the fact that you still have to have uh, influence and you have to be able to build things. But I also like the idea that it levels the playing field for really the, the real long-term vision of, of Patreon is for anybody to be an influencer because everybody knows somebody and everybody has an influence on something. Good answer. Great. How about you? Sure. My name is Jared Colitis. I am the marketing advisor for Patreon. Uh, first met the team working on another project back in December uh, called Tradov. Uh, we had a blast working together. Uh, eventually started talking about uh, the ICO that they wanted to run. Uh, so I joined uh, in December shortly after. Uh, it's been a great ride. One of the things I like is that uh, at Sushi, the founder, is an influencer, so he comes from that world, he knows the pain points, and it's really a passion project. Uh, besides that, the team is awesome, uh, everybody's really enthusiastic to build a product that's going to last, that can scale globally, um, and I think there's a real need in the market for that. So, happy to be here, and other great advisors on board too, which makes it fun. So, my, my uh, point of view is roughly this, you know, if you think about uh, the internet, almost the worst thing about the internet is advertising. I mean, it totally sucks. Did you ever go and look at a pair of shoes on an e-commerce site like Amazon, and then for the next three weeks, you saw the same pair of shoes show up time after time after time? It's called remarketing. So advertising is kind of a really dumb way to spread a message. Um, my hobby is photography. And I can tell you, when I want to figure out whether to buy the next Sony camera, like the A7R II, I don't look at an ad. 
I go to look for experts who already understand photography, who already know what this camera is capable of and can already compare it to other cameras and give me a point of view. And this idea of an influencer who has knowledge influencing other people who want to learn that knowledge, it's as old, it's very old, but it's even old on the internet. When the internet first started, there was a thing called news groups. And on news groups, uh, they all had these names. So if, if it was photography, it would be alt.photography.cameras.sony. And if you went there, you would find all the experts on Sony cameras. They were right there. And you as a newbie could ask them questions. That, that's what the internet's awesome at. Now, the bad news is mostly influencers don't get paid. They do it for free because they love what they know. Now they can get paid and the blockchain is a great way to measure what they do for you and then to pay them and reward them for having done it and suddenly your hobby can become a way of earning money. To me that's awesome and that's what, uh, I say patron, it's like potato, potato. <laughs> they say patron, patron, patron. That's what, that's what the company does and that's why uh, I love it. And the only bad thing is it's Japanese. I mean, if, if only it was American. <laughs> Soon, soon. I'm, I'm kidding, I love Japanese people. A hash graph. Yes. Okay, I can take that one on. Um, I'm an advisor to hash graph. It's a new consensus algorithm. It's a very elegant way to do, to build a, a distributed blockchain without using a traditional blockchain architecture. But one of the, the notable things about hash graph is it allows you to do very, very fast transaction settlement in a decentralized way. It's a, it's a, it's a technology that's emerging and it's evolving and like any other technology it's going to take some time for Hashgraph to prove itself in real networks but it's actually um, in a private sense it's been used in banking and in, in uh, using private transactions for um, different types of banking mechanisms and now it's moving into a decentralized kind of uh, consensus algorithm blockchain so one of the things about if you look at a platform like Patreon and you want to get to a peer-to-peer -peer where you have individuals who are actually looking at other individuals probably on their mobile phones maybe on their computers you want to be able to have all the transactions away from the centralized notion of there's some central place doing it and have a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized transaction take place so Hashgraph is a is a technology that we are going to over time try to figure out how to work into into the uh, platform of Patreon. So it's a way of avoiding the need for a centralized authority. Essentially, yes. And, and, uh, and, and, and does it give, um, does it measure somebody's influence as well? Like, do, can you tell, let's say in photography, uh, can we tell that I'm more influential than you, or you're infl more influential than me? Is, is the platform going to do that? I think it is to some The extent. platform will do that, of course. The, the, the underlying idea of, uh, well, an example would be, you have something, a situation where someone's traveling and they're, in, they're going to a meeting and they decide that they, they're new, doing a new marketing campaign and they need an influencer. And they look on their cell phone and they look through it and they've got some criteria listed in it and they say, oh, a certain person pops up and they're in an emergency and they need it now. They click a button, like it, it, in a real-time distributed transaction, that actually, when he clicks the button, that'll hire that person immediately, and then there's no need for it to go to a central place and wait for things to happen. And that's the beauty of a decentralized platform. Right. So there, we, it's sort of like instantaneous gratification if you want to be able to have things. And that, that would be a good example if you need something like very quick for like, I need an influencer today to come in and help me with the project I have right now. I'm sitting in traffic or whatever, and, and that, that's more of a real-time settlement process. So that's, that's an example. Okay, any other questions from the audience? Is there any way of, let's say there's macro and micro influencers, is there a way of macro influencers coaching micro to kind of expand their growth and maybe sharing their perspective to their own audience? So, can, can, so the, the question there is, can you get paid for teaching somebody that doesn't have your skills to learn your skills. It's kind of what I do with Mike Larrington at TechCrunch. Mike, bear with me on this one. He was once very young and I was like his employer. He was working in a law firm. He worked with me for quite a few years and eventually he formed TechCrunch. And before that, he knew nothing about tech. He was a lawyer. And I told him, by the way, I got paid because I own TechCrunch stock. So this idea of mentoring leading to some kind of a reward 
kind of happens informally, can it happen more formally on this platform? Definitely, definitely. I mean, I, I think the platform, so when we're thinking from a marketing standpoint, uh, there's definitely a need for big name celebrities to kind of roll out. Um, but this platform is very much for everybody and I think that's what makes it unique. Um, if you have 500 followers in a niche, you can come on the platform, find a way to monetize, build a following, and then go from there. I think uh, engagement is also very important. So when we're thinking of the platform, fans can engage with influencers, with brands, um, and maybe that V2 is actually coaching, teaching. So I wouldn't call it out of the question for the near future, which is exciting. To, to, to me, a, a payment mechanism uh, that takes the form of a token has to be paying for something. Um, actually, if the token isn't paying for something, it probably isn't worth anything. So what is, what is uh, this token paying for? It's actually paying for all of the work of all of the influencers on behalf of everybody they work for, whether it's a brand or a colleague. And if you can get the effort, the global effort of every influencer to accept to be paid in an influencer token, that's worth billions of dollars, billions of dollars. And that billions of dollars used to exist either in the form of fiat currency, you know, dollars or yen or RMB, or it was done for free and didn't get paid for. If we can take that effort and reward it with a token that everyone trusts, that token's gonna, gonna be very valuable. And I think that's what every ICO should be trying to do in its own domain. It should be trying to capture the value of the underlying work and then making the token be an expression of that value. Uh -huh. On three, one, two, three. Petrol! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.